you, uh, President Kagame, for uh, joining us here. I just want to tell a little vignette. Um, I think it was about 15 years ago. I'm sort of time challenged, so nobody uh, fact checked me on this. We, um, I was invited to a, a small little kind of global infrastructure meeting that former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright was involved in. And you basically did whatever Madeleine Albright asked you to do. If she called you, I would say yes. And all of a sudden, with, with jet lag, ended up in a small room. Uh, you know, interesting people, didn't know them in Istanbul. Uh, and so I'm sitting there with this guy, no formality, no suit, no, uh, not a jacket, not a tie. And I said, hey, what do you do? And he says, I'm Paul Kagame. I'm president of Rwanda. And, that <laughs> and then we met at Clinton Global. We met, so this was you know, quite a long time ago, and we've had conversations. But what was really struck me at that moment so many years ago when we first talked was your vision for taking Rwanda out of the nightmares and uh, horrific experience it had and to writing a different story uh, for Rwanda. So, um, Mr. President, let me just state, you know, right now you're here for uh, many heads of state of, of uh, more than 40 different countries in the African continent um, with the President of the United States. Is this summit going to matter for Rwanda in any specific tangible way? Well, uh, yes, we are here, we are having a summit, uh, U.S., Africa, uh, getting together. We are here 2014. Uh, Did anything come out of that? Well, we had a good meeting. <laughs> At least we had a good meeting. <laughs> Even now, I think we are going to have a good meeting. Uh, the rest I and you were there then. You're one of the few that were at both. I was there. Uh, I was there 2014. Now, this time around, I'm here. Uh, we come and participate. We give our views about uh, many things uh, to do with Africa or to do with the relationship uh, with the U.S. And uh, we keep going. Well, I interviewed um, a woman yesterday. Uh, her name is Arikana Chihombori Kwao. If any of you know, she's the former African Union ambassador to the United States. She's right now uh, in Zimbabwe, and I interviewed her yesterday. And she said that the United States shows incredible disrespect towards Africa, that it did not share an agenda with the African leaders that it had asked for, um, and that this is more about China than it is about Africa. And I'd just be interested, it's an interesting frame that I think was uh, candid and was a critique of the approach that American policymakers, so what's, what are the, what's the tough love that American policymakers and President Biden need to hear about how they deal with African leaders? To begin with, the uh, problem of relationship with uh, China or with the United States is systemic. If you go many years back, when the international institutions were being formed, Africa was not uh, anywhere at the table where many issues were discussed. And from that time, what has always been uh, visible is the assumption that these big countries have to decide everything for themselves and for others, even others without participating or having a say at all. Some people call it, uh, of course, uh, double standards, which I may understand, because there is a lot of uh, saying, uh, do as I say, not as I do. A lot of it goes on, and that's what describes the double standards. So, but with the relationship between Rwanda or Africa and China or Rwanda and Africa and the U.S., I think the most important thing is 
I will speak for myself, I will speak for Rwanda. I'm sure many Africans would have a lot to say. I don't think we need to be bullied into taking or making choices, choosing between US or, 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 or China. It's really none of our business. I think we need to have both and others as partners in as far as they also respect us and, and understand that we have something to contribute. Uh, there is a lot at stake for us. So we, we can have something to say. We need to have something to say. So whatever is going on between China and the US, and then that being brought to Africa, is something we need to treat carefully ourselves. Uh, minding our business, we, are, we have countries to run, we have a continent that should be, in this conversation, the way it should be. So there is therefore, on our part, at least as far as Rwanda is concerned, to, to, to resist being drawn into these big power plays uh, and just associate with uh, anyone who gives the benefit to the country or who listens to you and respects you. And I think that's the way I would prefer we go about the business. When you and I chatted last year, you know, I raised the U.S.-China issue and said, Steve, you know, U.S.-China are important, et cetera, we can deal with them, but, you know, Rwanda has its own story. If you go to an, uh, an American in Oklahoma, uh, Alabama, anywhere, who may not be tuning in right now and said, what do you think about Rwanda? For them, the frame is probably about the genocide. That's what they last know and remember. Others, you know, we see a lot of coverage of you. See, a, you know, the Paul Kagame story is one where, um, uh, some people look at you as a liberator, a savior. Other people you look at you as a strong man, you know, who wants to keep his job a long time. What is the Rwanda story that you want um, Americans to know, um, others uh, from the continent to know? What is the proactive Paul Kagame agenda that you put on the table? Rwanda is not just a statistic. We are there. We exist. And... Uh, we have to make sure uh, Rwandans live their lives the way they have chosen to, not being dictated to by anyone. Whatever problems Rwanda has, so do these other countries, big or small, have their own problems. I can't be dealing with my problems and allow you to bring on top of that your own problems. So I have to deal with my problems the way the people of the country have chosen. And uh, of course, mindful of the fact that uh, there is no country that uh, uh, lives on its own or stands alone. It's not an island. We, 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 we relate with others. We have to relate with others. There's no question about it. We have to listen to other people, what they say about us. And we must tell other people what we think about ourselves and what we want to do for ourselves. So in that interaction, that's where we all benefit. Uh, I can't uh, be there. In fact, if you look at even our own history, the many problems the country had, uh, many would attribute uh, that history to external factors. They talk about colonial times and what happened and so on and so forth. For us today, we are not there. We've left that behind us. Mm -hmm. What happened in the past happened. We learned lessons but you have to look more to the future than to be caught up in the blame game of who did what to us in the past. 
Now we are there. What are you going to do for yourselves? Is the question. So that's what we concentrate on. We concentrate on saying, whatever happened in the past happened. Have we learned lessons? What do we do for ourselves? So the people you would ask about Rwanda and tell you all kinds of stories. There are different uh, categories of people. There are those who know absolutely nothing about Rwanda, and yet they want to tell the stories about Rwanda. There are others who know the stories, but they have uh, their own views of how Rwanda should be, and so on and so forth. They have their own right to do that. There is another category of those who know. In fact, it is their story. Mm -hmm. They want to tell it as it is, or they want to do whatever is possible for them to contribute to the well-being of Rwanda. And that's the other category. So we have to steer through all these uh, uh, different uh, categories and views. Uh, but the country has to have uh, a direction. And that is the responsibility of the leaders of the country. You know, if I were to you know, put on the table that there are sort of three angles of a story right, on, on Rwanda that I think they would be out there. You might not agree with them, but uh, you know, one would be a friend of mine that many of us know, Mark Dybul, is in Kigali today for the second big uh, uh, African summit on public health in Kigali. Uh, they're launched, you know, you're opening a new uh, biopharmaceutical industrial park and into a very positive sort of modern, interesting story. COVID uh, vaccines now being uh, tried in your public health. That's one story. Another story that many Americans know is Paul, we've talked about it before, Paul Rosessa Bagina, uh, who's very popular in the United States, in prison now in Rwanda. And I think you've been in you know, potential discussions about him with uh, others like uh, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, and we classify Paul as a wrongly detained person. There are concerns here. And then there's the third with the conversation with Secretary Blinken that you had last week about the DRC and about Rwanda's activities and concerns that you might be dis destabilizing the DRC. So those three stories, if you were to do it, my question to you is why not solve the DRC and the Paul story and have more of the modernization tech, we're growing our economy. And you get defined in different ways in the international community. Why not solve the two and elevate the third? Well, to begin with, there is no guarantee that even if you did what they want you to do, you would actually get those promises you're talking about. Uh, we've been there for, uh, now the country has been moving on for 28 years. Um, how about what happened before actually those stories came up? There wasn't much flowing in that sense that later on was stopped by those stories. So, uh, but that's a, a different thing. Let me quickly answer, the, you know, speak to the two problems. The story of Rusesawajan. And in fact, it explains now, uh, at the beginning, wh what happens with the countries and the relationships and so on. A big country like the United States dealing with uh, Rwanda, a small country somewhere in the middle of Africa. What I was saying when people just tell you what to do or want to tell you what to do for yourself, comes in this sense. That story of Paul says, the case is very clear. It has gone through the courts of law with the due process, the evidence, the facts about the case were presented in the open. The history of that is also clear. It has been told. Now, there's something wrong here that... And it involves the European Sabagina courts. Has. Did it involve the European courts? What? With Paul, did it involve the European courts as well? 
I, I, okay. That would be another big problem if it involved the other coasts outside of Rwanda. I'm talking about Rwanda mm. in our legitimate right to do what we have to do for ourselves. But he's charged with other 20 people. In other words, there are 21. In fact, all of them found guilty on the basis of that evidence and facts presented before the court. The other 20 are not complaining because some of them admitted what they were involved in and with Lucia Savagina as even at one time their leader. Mm. Now, with this situation, somebody comes and says, you know, this person is, is famous, you know, he's a celebrity, you have to think, and, and he's a, a resident of the United States. So by that, you've got to release this person. And some of us have raised the, 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 this question and say, okay, we, 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 we let this one go free. How about the other 20? who have been in the same crime with him and have actually pointed to him as even having been their leader. That's one. So the second aspect to that is what are we going to have to deal with here? There's a serious case here, but it will be nullified because somebody in the United States is saying so. Well, some people may find that normal. I don't. Rwandans don't. So we might so, find... So is Blinken's advocacy and determination of, of him being wrongly detained helping his case or hurting his case? I think from what I have said, you can conclude. Hmm. Yes. Oh. Because we've made it clear there isn't anybody mm. going to come from anywhere to bully us into something to do with our lives. And we accept it. it. Just finally, is there an... You can maybe make an invasion and overrun the country. You can do that, but... That, that is there an arrangement with him that would work to, you know, it's, it, to, to, again, I think that the tension is, again, to come back to the biopharmaceutical park, to come back to, you know, what Qualcomm and others are doing in this state, to look at, you know, the advancement, you know, the, the bets you're making on technology. Is there not a, a path to help solving, check that problem, or is it just going to remain part of the Rwanda picture? But why have this problem isolated? And, and how about other many problems that happen in the country? What happens? Mm. If we are going to be dealing with our problems in this manner, that the one associated with somebody who is powerful will not be held accountable but the rest will be held accountable. I, 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 don't, I don't understand it for, for anything. But let me quickly go to the Congo problem. For Savajina's case, I think it's clearly where it is. People can keep talking about it. I'm not interested in going into a lot of other details here and there, but those also are happening. But what, so I, what I wanted to tell you was the general frame of mind around this case and how it operates. It doesn't matter, because we can't just make one person so important that they want to be held accountable. And by the way, this is even when the person we are talking about himself provided evidence against himself by saying what he said and uh, that is on a camera that can't be disputed. And the responsibility of deaths of people, of Rwandans, mm. if anyone thinks it can just be wished away because uh, of some things, 
Well, we'll see how to deal with that. But let me go to the Congo programs. First, again, I simply try to bring out facts. This Congo problem, the Eastern Congo, where there are over a hundred armed groups, local armed groups in Eastern Congo, a hundred. One of them being the one they call M23, but there are a hundred. The M23, and uh, there are many refugees. We have about 80,000 refugees in Rwanda from Congo who are associated with this group, meaning their relatives or whatever. Now, what I want to say clearly, this problem was not created by Rwanda and is not Rwanda's problem. It is Congo's problem. They are the ones that have to deal with it. Now, to say that we can be helpful also, and, and the region is trying to deal with the matter, the East African region, to which now DRC also has become a member of, that's okay. But it seems the entire responsibility has been put on the shoulders of Rwanda, be it the Congolese leaders and the government, be it the international community, be it everybody is running away from that problem, and they say, oh, this is uh, Rwanda's problem. And we say, no, it's not our problem for what has produced these armed groups, including the fact that these uh, groups, I said, the refugees in Rwanda and then the M23, are Congolese of Rwandan ethnicity. This is all it is. So if you wanted to hold anybody responsible, then maybe you'd go back to history when the borders were being drawn and some people were left on the other side of the border and uh, the other became another country. I cannot be responsible for the fact that there are Congolese of Rwandan ethnicity in Congo who are being denied their rights as citizens. That's not my problem. So do you think Secretary Blinken has an incomplete picture or a wrong picture and has he revised his picture? I really don't know. <laughs> I'm just stating, I'm just stating facts. Anybody who would wish to dispute that is welcome. We can have an argument. I'm just stating the facts. How anybody else is interpreting those facts, they have to produce their own evidence to convince people as to what to believe. So let's discuss the third leg. My friend Mark Dybel, you know, many of you know, was uh, the PEPFAR um, AIDS ambassador under President Bush, is in Kigali right now, who may be watching, um, and he's at a major health summit in Rwanda. Um, there are major steps being taken uh, in the public health space. You've created this new park. So tell us about that picture of what Rwanda is investing in by way of new tech and how your future is going to be tied into this new range. And not just in the biopharmaceutical space, in tele, I mean, you're doing a lot in the technology sphere and would love to just hear your vision of whether, you know, not to, to say it's the same thing, but, you know, Southeast Asia, South Korea used to be one of the poorest places in the world, is now one of the richest and is there. Do you have a vision along the lines of what some of the tech tigers did in Asia that is informing what you want Rwanda to be uh, in the African continent? Before I come to that, I've remembered something I should mention here, uh, relating to the previous question. Tied with the, what is happening in Eastern Congo, is the FDRR. These are the remnants of the... Say one more time. FDRR, these are remnants of uh, the groups that carried out genocide in Rwanda, who have lived in Eastern Congo for all these years. And in this particular case, what is very clear 
they've been helped by getting arms and fighting alongside government forces. Mm. And the government is aware of that, and we have brought it to their attention several times and given them facts again. So the, there is a mix of uh, the problems that concern us. In fact, this problem, we thought we had resolved it because most of them and their families have been repatriated with the help of uh, the UN mm. and were being brought back to Rwanda and being reintegrated. But they, they are the hardliners who stayed behind, and for them, uh, they will not rest until uh, they have either invaded or carried out changes in the country. Uh, so the whole mix, therefore, uh, I think gets confused, and when we are telling people this is not the other problem, it's not ours, but ours is there, and everybody has ignored it. We want them to think about how to separate the two problems so that we deal with one at a time as it should be dealt with. Mm -hmm. So I, I leave it at that and let me quickly go to the... We've been, since we had a vision 2020, which now we are two years past, and now we have created another vision 2050. Mm -hmm. But in the first... Are you going to still be president in 2050? Well, I, I, I just, oh. Oh. I, I just uh, wish, I, I, like anyone else here, we, 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 we'll live, see. We, we live only for so long. <laughs> so uh, then, uh, uh, yeah, so I think about uh, that. But right. So with a plan. That's not even. That's not really my my worry at all. Yeah. If I'm alive, there are many things I can do. Uh, beyond being president. But um, if living up to 2050 means I need to be president, maybe I can think about it. <laughs> <laughs> so the vision was about education right. and training of our people to have skills. Second was technology as an, as an enabler for many things to happen, and then infrastructure, and uh, also markets, meaning we prioritize, we prioritize regional integration, and so on and so forth. So that's really how this whole thing came. And Mark Daibo is in Ikigari attending a health conference. Mm. And around that, as, as you said, we saw for a fact the last uh, situation of the pandemic uh, during the COVID. We, 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 most countries in Africa, actually all of them, were very helpless. Mm -hmm. Even when the vaccines were out there, uh, we were the last to get uh, vaccinated. We mm -hmm. couldn't get vaccines. All advanced countries uh, had to first take care of themselves. And, uh, How long did it take you to actually get the vaccine in Rwanda to your citizens? Well, it took uh, nine months. Nine months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were surviving and just trying to be, you know, careful and uh, following the right. scientific advice of how we can uh, uh, take care of that. But now I'm saying we quickly made investments. In Africa, we are going to have an mRNA right. vaccine uh, made in Rwanda with the help of BioNTech. There are other efforts in Ghana, in Senegal, in South Africa. Uh, so, but this is one of the reasons we, in advance, we thought about uh, investing heavily in technology not just biotech, but also in other areas. Uh, that's why we have uh, uh, in our country coding academies, of young people, so that we have also focused on right. ICT and, and other things. So technology has become uh, for us, of course, even when we started, the people are saying, how, how do you think about uh, 
information and communication technologies when you need food, you need schools, you need this and that, we said, well, that actually goes alongside all of those other efforts. Mm. We don't have to choose, right. say, we invest in, in agriculture, but not in health or not in technology. So technology has been a priority for us for a long time. Yeah, I want to take a few questions from the audience in a minute, but I've got a few lightning round questions. You know, one, are you having a bilateral meeting with President Biden? Uh, not sure yet. Not sure yet. Do you want one? Why would I come out of the way? <laughs> <laughs> and not maybe have one when there is. President Biden has <laughs> talked about the African Union with regards to, say, G20, you know, being there. Are there... Are there Again, to come back to my discussion with Ambassador Chihombori, she said, look, we're, we're um, Africa, I'm saying we, but Africa, is systemically ignored and, and treated disrespectfully by much of the rest, by America, by the rest, and we need to fix some structures. We need to fix the UN. Uh, I'm speaking for her. Uh, words she used, we need to be see an African Union representation on the UN Security Council. We need to be in the uh, leading... Uh, geo-economic um, structures of the world, and we're not there, uh, she said. Uh, just what are your quick views on that? Do you agree with her? Well, I'm glad she said it for us, because if we said it, we would be misunderstood, and maybe accompanied by many other things. So I'm glad she said it. Hmm. What would you tell President Biden if you could share with us if you do get your bilateral? Well, I would say that... Uh, Africa should not be ignored. Mm. Africa is not uh, just to be seen as a, a place of problems, uh, because as we have seen uh, even in the recent times, uh, everybody has problems. Yeah. There's not a single yeah. country that doesn't yeah. have problems. Not and a single one. So some problems bigger than others, mm. But everybody has problems. But what I would say is to have uh, uh, an African policy in place that works and can be predictable and people can contribute within and towards that. And finally, right here in the same stage, <clears throat> on Monday I interviewed Chin Gong, the ambassador of China to the United States. And, um, you know, my intelligence services tell me, my Steve Clemens intel, you know, that there's a good chance he'll be named foreign minister of China shortly. He said he would go, uh, if he was in such a position, potentially to Africa. Africa is the bedrock of Chinese foreign policy. I asked him about the Chinese debt trap, the so-called debt trap, and he said there is no debt trap. I think I'm paraphrasing, there's sort of debt opportunities or their financial opportunities. But is there a Chinese that when you look around other states in Africa, maybe with Rwanda, are there problems, even geopolitical problems, in the financing and trade and economic relationship with China that we should be aware of? Well, if there is uh, any debt trap within a country and China, I think we should blame it on both sides. Mm. Because if you keep being drawn into a debt that you are not sure how you're going to pay to repay the debt, then you also have a problem as the one who keeps giving you money. But for them, those ones who keep giving you money and mm. knowing that you won't be able to pay, maybe for them the, it's a plan. In the end, they own everything uh, about you. Mm. So that's a problem. But I have to say this. Um, given China's or any other country's investment, say, in Africa, China will necessarily find a way to bring their money into Africa because it is simple that there are gaps, and therefore, they take advantage of filling those gaps. Mm. But the question should go to the other side, whether United States or Europe or others. Where are there these gaps? Mm. Why don't you make the investments? The investments, gaps that China takes advantage of, 
and comes and uh, does whatever they do. So you can't complain about China coming to Africa and doing whatever they are doing, mm. bad or good, and you are there not doing anything about investing yourself in the mm. continent. Mm. I think this has to be looked at critically and maybe it will help address, address most of this. Some people may not go to China if they are having what they need with others. As you know, I'm looking at your communications person, Stephanie. I could talk with him for hours, but I know you want me to go to Q&A. So, Alexis, I'm going to go to you first. Um, we have a microphone because we're streaming live. I want to make sure that Alexis is here. We'll go around a little bit. Um, this is Alexis from our team. Alexis, and identify yourself so the world knows. Okay. So, my name is Alexis Akwa I'm, I am the managing editor for Summer 4 Africa. Um, and my question is focused on the relationship with the UK. So I wanted to know, can you share any details about the agreement regarding asylum seekers being processed in Rwanda, the UK asylum seekers? And then as a follow-up to that, have you, any, have you had any discussions with the new British Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, on this subject or anything else? Well, I have met uh, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister of the UK, when you were attending the G20 summit. So that one, you can put it aside. The main question of uh, migrants from UK, we have explained, it's not the first of its kind. We have had, it started with uh, one time we had uh, uh, something like that going with uh, Israel uh, when they were sending people some migrants for one clear reason. The second, and which was very important, even more important for me, was what we did in Libya and still is going on. That was in 2018. The, the, the Israel case was in 2017 and in the, the, the Libyan one was 2018. We were having thousands of mainly young Africans caught up in the Libyan situation. They had wanted to cross into Europe and they could not. Others anyway were trying and drowning in the Mediterranean. And uh, so, they were in prison, and then some people actually went to Libya, and they were being bought and taken as slaves to some other places. So we said, look, we, uh, in fact, that time what helped, I was the chairman of the African Union in 2018. So I said, you know what, let's save these young Africans who are dying in their thousands, going, trying to go to, to Europe. Mm. And by saying, I said, I would start by suggesting that let's find another way of bringing them out of Libya so that they stop dying or being sold as slaves and so on and so forth. Bring them to Rwanda and we shall call upon these international institutions and others to come and screen them and find a good way of taking them where they want to go. If there are countries in Europe that are ready to accept them, they can therefore go there in another fashion. Or if they want to go back home because they are trapped here in Libya, then still they can be taken back home in another manner. And we even offered that for those who will not find a place in Europe or America or Canada or wherever and don't want to go home, we shall give them a home in Rwanda. Mm. This, this was the, the, way, the whole thing. So, and this is what really happened uh, that we tried to do, even with the UK. The UK is the one that approached us, and they had uh, problems. Mainly, we were convinced by the fact that some of these are illegal migrants, and they have problems with that. And they were saying, so they learned from that process which you are carrying out for Libya, by the way, which is still going on now. There are many people we have in Rwanda, and they are being processed by 
the institution is responsible, the international institutions, and some of them have found home in uh, the Scandinavian countries, Canada, I don't know where the others came here to the US, but I know for sure to the US, those others whom I said were mm -hmm. from Congo have been brought here, I, 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 and that there are about 9,000 who were brought here. So that is really how the, the, this uh, operation, or, or the project we have with UK started. Right. And that's, even now, it, anyway, it hasn't started in full because I think the UK is still having legal issues right. to sort out, and that's not uh, our problem. When that is sorted out, we shall have them, we can process them, and these people will go wherever they want to go. Th thank you. Yes, right here. My name is Emily Lapukuyu Brown. I'm the founder and executive director of the African Youth and Women Empowerment Initiative. President Kigami, let me first and foremost say it's remarkable what you've done with Rwanda. I'm a survivor of war. I come from the West African country of Liberia, where we had the same tribalism issues as you had in the past. We're a population of a little under go. 5 million people. I'd appreciate people. it because you're fantastic, but short form. We're a population of about 5 million people. And ever since we recovered from war 2003, we found it incredibly difficult to recover as a whole. I'd like to know from you, what is it that we need to do as a country, as a government, as a people to ensure that we reach our full potential and enjoy all of the resources that come with us and the leadership that we need. Thank, Thank you. you. Right, right. You. In, in short, I would say any country has leaders, and the first task of leaders in that kind of situation is to try and find a way of, one, building institutions, two, a process where there could be trust between the people and the government and trust within the population themselves. So it's upon the government, the leaders of any country at different levels to embrace this and have clarity as to how to go about it, but it will succeed in one place. But the fact that we have made progress in our case is an example that anybody else can make progress in that situation. Uh, Justin, I'm going to him because he's my boss. Justin. <laughs> Thank you. Justin Smith, uh, founder, CEO of Semaphore. Um, th this event, as you know, is maybe from behind you, is sponsored by three American companies, Qualcomm, MasterCard, and Cisco, who are very interested in expanding their presence in, in Africa. I, I've a, I want to ask you a question or I get your reaction to a comment that I heard in private from one of Africa's leading business leaders who said, uh, Justin, you know, our, our hearts are with America, but our brains are with China. I might skip the U.S. Leadership Summit and spend some time in the Gulf where people pay attention to us. What are your thoughts about that? And what are your, is your advice to American companies trying to take on that type of cynicism? Well, unfortunately, I'm not the one to get rid of that cynicism. It's the other ones who... But for sure, on a serious note, I think the United States of America needs to think uh, seriously about how to deal with Africa in a very beneficial way in terms of investing and the different investments that uh, could come by private sector, I think would make a big difference. Our task in Africa has been also to prepare the environment to welcome these investments, big or small. Uh, it is our task. I, I think People will not just walk into Africa or Rwanda or any place until there is something that is attracting them. We have to create that attractive environment uh, for that to happen. 
and we have to speak out and speak up and talk about it and keep demanding so that uh, but those are the complaints you know but the attitude of course in between this was saying I, I was saying I don't know I don't know exactly what to, to make of it I don't know how we can change the attitude uh, with which people look at Africa uh, other than trying to prepare the side or side Rwanda and Africa to say here we are we, 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 we want this we, we are worth this we uh, you come to us let's do business but still it is the other side to make the decision whether that makes sense to them or they would rather go somewhere else let me just, we're right, I apologize to everybody with questions. I apologize, the president has to go. I've been given the uh, word. Um, I want Semaphore to have a conference like this in Africa. I'd love to do it in Kikali. Would you come speak? Would you, can we do this in? in? I, first of all, I give you the invitation to come. <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> and I make sure. Let me ask you just one fun question, you know, final thing. You know, a lot of people say, you know, Paul Kagame, he's a lot like Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore. He's built all these institutions, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of people who are your detractors say, wow, he's really like Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore. He's not, you know, there, 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 there are two stories of Lee Kuan Yew. Is there a point where you feel comfortable moving from being president, like, you know, Lee Kuan Yew was prime minister, to he became senior minister, of you becoming president and moving to senior president? And, and bringing in other... Or, or, or even being... Uh, uh, Thereafter, uh, just uh, an ordinary senior citizen. Mm. I don't mind. Yeah. Um, um, uh, you know, this uh, being president came to me by accident, actually. Mm. Uh, when it came, I embraced it, tried to do whatever I could do with it, and then uh, I, maybe I became a victim of what I was able to do with our people. Mm. Uh, otherwise, for me, it's, it's not... Uh, somebody else was supposed to be president, but... Mm. And did for some time. Then uh, people came to me and said, we told you, because I had refused to be president mm. at first. Because I even felt I wasn't prepared. I, mm. I was just... I had just uh, in 94, come out of the war and all this chaos. And, and, and I thought I could be doing something else mm. better. Uh, but those who I thought qualified better than me came, tried before too long. I think the first time was six years, somebody spent there and mm. uh, got, ran into problems. And then, so for me, Syria not a big deal. I, I think I've done what I could as a person, a human being, and uh, I, I'm happy to leave the stage and go anywhere and just keep looking back and say I made my contribution. Well, I want to say on behalf of everyone that we're, we're grateful that you're willing to have a conversation with us. I'll say I think the risk for the Biden administration and for Washington and the United States right now is that we have a big bang conference with Africa and that next week we've forgotten it. I don't think Semaphore is going to do that, that our conversation, I hope we can continue to have a conversation, candor uh, back and forth. And I know that our team with Semaphore Africa will continue to be consistently uh, and fairly engaged in Africa. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank President, you. Thank for joining you, us. Steve. Thank you.